Hello everyone, welcome to the Materials Project Seminar Series. This series is co-organized by the Materials Project and the Materials Virtual Lab at UC San Diego. The MP Seminar Series are monthly talks from top researchers in the field, focused on uh, topics of interest to the MP community, examples including uh, computational materials design, the use of MP tools such as the Pymagine file works to perform materials research, and also the very hot topic in our days, which is uh, machine learning applied to materials research. During the talk, please use the Q&A button on the bottom to ask any questions. The questions will be answered after the talk by the speaker, or uh, Matt and I can chip in for more generic questions. And for those of you who are watching a video recording, and you can ask your questions at our forum at uh, mathscience.org with the Materials Project channel. So the recordings will be published to a few locations after the talk, including the Materials Project Seminar website, as well as the Materials Virtual Lab YouTube channel. We are actively looking for our speakers in the coming month, so please nominate the researchers that you like the most uh, to our email list. The upcoming seminar for November will be uh, from Dr. Artrith Nonok, and she is a new assistant professor at uh, Utrecht University. For those of you who are interested in machine learning applied to chemistry and material science, you won't want to miss her talk because she's absolutely one of the experts in this field. We are still looking for a uh, December and January speakers, so please nominate your uh, candidates. So today we have uh, Dr. Kamal Choudhury. He is a scientist and the founder of the Jarvis uh, Database and Tools at NIST, and he is also a scientist at Science Research. He obtained his PhD from University of Florida in 2015, and then joined the NIST. His research interests are focused on atomistic materials design using classical, quantum, and machine learning methods. In particular, as I mentioned, he has developed the Jarvis database and tools uh, that host publicly available data sets for millions of materials properties. And he's definitely one of the most active and uh, uh, established young researchers in the field. Uh, he has published more than 50 research articles in various reputed journals, and is also a uh, very active member of the TMS, APS, and MRS societies. Unfortunately, uh, Kamar is having some issues with the internet connection, so today his talk will be uh, will be a pre-recorded video, and uh, but he's also online for answering any questions. So again, please feel free to use the Q and A button to ask him any questions regarding this talk. Thank you. Hello everybody, welcome. My name is Kamal Chaudhary. I'm a research scientist at NIST. And I'd like to thank the Materials Project Seminar Series organizers for giving this opportunity to present this talk. I'll talk about the deep learning and quantum computation methods for improved materials design. So materials design is actually a quite an old topic. Um, we, have, uh, we have seen Mendeleev table and Dolphin's atomic structure idea for more than 300 years. And the idea is if we take a bunch of atomic elements and put in a particular lattice or particular arrangement, what will be the um, property of that material? You know? Or the reverse way, we want this particular property, what should be the combination of my elements and what should be the arrangement of that elements and atoms? So this is actually a very hard problem. We can use something like many body surrender equation to predict properties, um, but it's actually very computationally expensive. We can use experiments, but uh, it takes quite uh, some time to prepare the and uh, synthesize the materials and so on, the trial and error method and so on. And so we have tried experiment, we have tried some empirical rules, uh, we have tried um, uh, computational methods such as density functional theory and other ad initio and molecular dynamics, et cetera, methods. And right now, I think we are in a very good time of uh, having this data intensive age. So uh, in this age, um, one of the key uh, development is the deep learning and quantum computation. So we will see how can we leverage this really uh, amazing progress in this field for materials design. So 
Uh, today I'll talk about the deep learning and quantum computation and especially I'll talk about three packages, atomistic line graph neural network, atom vision, and atom uh, quantum computation or atom QC packages. These all projects are part of Jarvis, which is uh, available at jarvis.nist.gov. Um, and this is again a part of material genomicity at NIST. So the name Jarvis has some history behind it, but I'll not go into the detail. Rather, um, I would like to say that um, Jarvis, the name is inspired from a sci-fi movie. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, before I go into the details, I really would like to thank uh, several collaborators and colleagues who, without uh, help of whom, this project would not be successful the way it is. So I would like to thank Francesca Tevetsa, Kevin Garrity, Brian Dicos, especially they are the core members of the Jarvis team. In addition to that, I would like to thank other folks at NEST, and I'm only listing a few of them, and other uh, collaborators at several national lab and universities. So this is my outline for the talk. I'll give the motivation behind doing this deep learning and quantum computation work, and I'll give a, a few slides on Jarvis infrastructure, and then I'll give around 10, 15 slides on each of the aligned atom vision and atom QC, and then I'll conclude. So what is the motivation behind this work? So the idea behind this work is to really accelerate material design using both computation and experiments. We want to automate experimental data analysis. There are a ton and ton of data, so we don't want people to staring at it and analyze those data. We want to discover new material the way we want it. Uh, we want to develop new methods. We want to find new phenomena, interesting phenomena, and we want to enhance reproducibility. So there are several challenges for this work. One of them is high uh, fidelity and diverse data and balanced data set. And when I say material science, we talk about the structure property performance relationship. When I say structure, it might mean different things. It might mean crystal structure. It might mean molecular structure. It might mean protein structure. It might mean uh, microscopy images. It might mean uh, spectral uh, properties such as X-ray diffraction. So there are a wide variety of data set and uh, having a curated data set is really useful and the precursors for having a machine learning or deep learning techniques applications. Luckily, uh, due to the Materials Genome Initiative um, launched by the former President Barack Obama about 10 years ago, uh, such, such work of curating data sets and uh, making data informatics models for machine learning for materials have really, uh, gotten along and uh, we are seeing rapid, rapid progress in this field. Uh, no matter what field or no matter what research areas are you working on, material science is a key component of it. So whether you want to uh, make a better rocket or you want to make a better uh, biological devices, you need a sophisticated material. So the idea is whether we can expedite this whole process. So I'd like to start with this uh, one slider on this Jarvis which is available at jarvis.nist.gov. We have uh, we recently have this uh, user counting things. So it was started in 2017. Uh, the whole project started in 2017 using Material Genome Initiative. We have around 6,000 world worldwide users. We organize this artificial intelligence for material science and quantum matters for material science workshops. We are getting nice feedback from the whole community. And right now, the jarvis.nist.gov requires login. So please feel free to register. Um, so Jarvis has several components to it, such as density functional theory, machine learning, force field, and other. Um, and the code base is available at US NISCAP slash Jarvis GitHub page. And more details about it can be found in this NPG Computational Materials article. And as you can see, they, ha they have been uh, downloaded and used multiple times. So as I said, we started in 2017. We actually started with uh, Jarvis FF, Jarvis force field to evaluate classical force with our interatomic potentials. So for that, we used materials project at that time, uh, the energetics and the elastic constant data to check whether a classical force field is suitable for particular applications or not. Then um, we saw uh, that uh, there's a need for the 2D materials database. So in 2017, we developed a lattice constant criteria and then we use that for the materials project data set. And then we um, discovered around 1,000 new 2D materials 
and we actually validated using exploration energy calculation using the opt BDH functional intensity functional theory. So that was 2017. In 2018, we developed uh, using this opt BDH functional elastic tensor database using the finite difference methods for 3D and 2D systems. Um, we also saw that there is a need of uh, uh, better band gaps in DFT. So standard DFT underestimates uh, band gaps severely. So you want something which should be more closer to experiments and reality. So, um, and higher level methods are more time consuming. So we wanted to uh, find a middle ground. So the meta GGA, something like Tran Blahamary modified Becky Johnson was pretty useful. So we made a database for that. And in addition to band gap database, we also made a database of dielectric functions, frequency dependent dielectric functions. In 2018, we also came up with this descriptor set called classical force field inspired descriptor, which can describe uh, materials, chemistry and structural information. Um, in 2018, we also extended the Jarvis FF for the defect properties such as surface and uh, point vacancies. In 2019, we uh, developed this solar spectroscope, spectroscopic limited maximum efficiency, solar efficiency data set. Uh, and we came up with this uh, spin orbit uh, spillage criteria, which basically compares the wave function with and without spin orbit coupling to check whether a material is topologically trivial or non-trivial. And we applied for 3D materials uh, for both metals and semi metals. In 2019, we uh, we had a, a key point convergence paper with density functional theory and machine learning. In 2020, we uh, applied this DFT ML hybrid approach for thermoelectrics and applied for 3D and 2D materials. Uh, and then um, we extended the topological spin orbit criteria for 2D materials for both magnetic and non-magnetic systems. We have a 2D heterostructure app design. So using the 2D structure database, we could predict the band alignment and the uh, lattice mismatch, etc. We extended the density functional perturbation theory uh, uh, database for, from which we get the directory function, piezoelectric tensor, infrared intensity, and other key properties. We also developed this electric field gradient database from which we can calculate the nuclear quadruple resonance and nuclear magnetic resonance spectra. In 2021, um, which is this year, we are actually working on Atom QC, which is the quantum computation package with uh, variation quantum uh, eigen solver and variation quantum deflation, which I'm gonna talk about. Uh, also, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the Jarvis Align, atomistic line graph, which we, allied, which we applied to solids, molecules, and MOF and other uh, materials classes. Atom Vision, which is applied to scanning transmission electron microscopy and scanning uh, tunneling microscopy images. Uh, heavily focus on uncertainty quantification as so many models are being developed. It's important to uh, evaluate the uncertainty. Um, and then we have anomalous quantum combining effect, direct air capture using metal organic framework, one year tight binding Hamiltonian database uh, for both electrons and phonon, TB35 uh, for three body tight binding uh, models for more than 60 atoms and their binaries and ternaries. Um, Density functional theory and machine learning applied to the topological spin orbit spillage criteria, which we applied to 3D magnetic as well as non magnetic system. And we actually verified a few of them using experiment. And we are linking with the Optimate project this year. So uh, we also already have an implementation of it for the fair principles of the data sharing. So these are only some of the projects. And uh, as you can see, there is a rapid expansion of projects and growth in this field. And uh, we are very glad to see this uh, progress. Um, in Jarvis, there are about 60,000 materials, 1,000 2D materials, and uh, 3D 60,000 3D materials, 110 force field, and more than a million properties. Um, there are several papers for each topic, but uh, today I'm going to focus on the three packages I'm going to talk about. But if you have interest in other projects, please feel free to look into. So uh, whenever I give uh, this chart, uh, this talk about uh, Jarvis DFT, I sometimes get this question, uh, the similarity and differences between materials project and other data sets. So I'm gonna just compare some of the properties with materials project. So we have to understand, or we have to realize that whenever we do uh, high throughput calculations, we do have to take certain approximations and we do have to make some deliberate uh, choices. So, um, in this case, we 
our uh, Jarvis DFT uses the vendor wall DFT obviated functional and Tron Blaha modified Becky Johnson and DFT plus spin orbit coupling cases. And we converged uh, the K point and cutoff for each material and we uh, converge on the energy and forces. So these are some of the key differences with materials project. They have materials project have more than two times of number of materials, but uh, having the such convergence and, and, and having more number of properties per material tend to make our database a little bit smaller than uh, bigger database with millions of materials and so on. Currently we have elastic tensor for around uh, 17,000 materials and we have uh, gamma point phonons. Uh, we have piezoelectric infrared uh, spectra and so on. We have dielectric tensor with and without ionic contribution. We have electric field gradient, Raman spectra, solar cell efficiency, topological spin orbit coupling spillage for distinguishing um, topological versus non-trivial topological materials, one year tire binding database and STM image data set. And there are many others, but uh, for sake of comparison, I think this would be serving the purpose. So before we do the uh, machine learning or deep learning training, we need to have a data set uh, already prepared for this. So there have been already several work for um, actually combining data set and making them interoperable. So uh, that is fine, but for machine learning purposes, we want data set as a snapshot and so that people can compare on top of it, not just uh, continuously growing data and changing number of data points, et cetera. So we took a snapshot of Jarvis data set, which is DFT 3D uh, for the bulk material, DFT 2D for 2D materials, Magnet, which is used for magnet models uh, for materials project and so on. There are multiple such databases and this can be easily loaded uh, in the uh, Jarvis tools package and then it can be fed into a machine learning or deep learning framework. So as I said, there are multiple databases such as QM9, etc. in this data set. Um, suppose uh, we don't uh, have such uh, some properties, then we can get from the actual database from the Jarvis DFT, which is uh, in the XML format, all the um, materials around the 60,000 materials have their own XML uh, format data set. So we can uh, parse this XML to get required information. So, um, so this is an active uh, repository and if you want to contribute your data set, please feel free to uh, reach out. So let's talk about the atomistic line graph neural network, which is available at US NISCOF slash align repository. Um, so uh, the preprint for this work is already available and archive and this paper is also accepted in NPJ computational materials. So it should be coming out soon. Uh, okay, <laughs> so I wanted to point out that neural networks are very popular, uh, so popular that they are making books for babies, which is quite interesting to me. Um, and, but we have to keep in mind that when uh, we do machine learning, we have to have at least certain level of understanding of linear algebra and calculus without which there can be uh, issues uh, when you do actually machine learning training. Uh, we are working on a review article on deep learning for material science with folks from uh, Materials Project, uh, it was NIST, uh, OQMD, uh, folks from Carnegie Mellon, Northwestern, um, and uh, Columbia. So this will be coming soon. Um, and I, we hope that this will be useful for the material science community. So uh, I'm gonna give a very quick introduction how to use ANN or artificial neural network and graph convolution neural network. So for a uh, conventional standard neural network, we have an input layer, input features, X1, X2. This can be, for example, this is your material and this is another material. You can describe them using an atomic number or average atomic number or average of uh, electronegativity and so on. So this is your features. Right, so you took these features and you know the output uh, and you're trying to make a model that can predict this output and we use this hidden layer, right? It's a very simple example, one layer, one hidden layer example. So any standard neural network will go through these uh, basic processes. So first you want to make a forward propagation. So uh, you have A0, in this case is X, or for L minus one layer, you take this input and then multiply with a weight matrix. matrix and then add a bias term. So this gives you activation. And then with the activation, you put a nonlinear activation function, such as sigmoid, uh, tan h, uh, relu, clu, leaky relu. There are so many 
um, and that that mix is uh, interesting and sigma the nonlinear activation function is very important without which the whole neural network is pr practically useless so once you have these activations we can write a cost function this cost function will be a function of this weight matrices and the biases and then we have the predictions from the neural network y tilde and then we have y the actual target data and then can make the cost function now there we can use gradient descent algorithm to minimize this uh, cost with respect to uh, the weight matrices and the biases so there are various methods to do that one of the most popular one is the uh, back, back propagation rule and which is based on the chain rule in calculus so this is standard neural network however if you use this for something like an image uh, which is actually a matrix here in the example of a six by six matrix if you use a fully con con uh, connected neural network there is too many parameters so the idea of convolution neural network is to use convolution function and use a shared weights so these are the some of the key steps for convolution neural network uh, and these are especially used for the image applications or image classification and etc so what we do here is we have a kernel or filter uh, a matrix matrix here is a matrix here and this is convolved over each of the blocks from the image and then uh, we can do element wise multiplication and sum and then we can pool uh, pooling operation either can be maximum average and sum and then we use the uh, what we have the fully connected uh, layer uh, standard neural network to make a forward prediction so this is convolution neural network graph convolution neural network so let's me talk about the graph a little bit uh, a graph is a is a entity we have nodes or vertices and edges and the node feature matrix so you can consider graph uh, multiple way it can be a social graph it can be atomic structure graph and so on so uh, for atomic structure you can imagine this uh, this is an atom and this is another atom which are connected but one and three are not connected so uh, this can be your boron this can be nitrogen this can be you know, phosphorus this can be another boron and so on so uh, for for each of these atom we have a feature matrix such as its atomic number its electronegativity and so on that is called the um, feature uh, uh, node features and then we want to know whether one is connected to two and one is connected to three and so on so that is given by the adjacency matrix what is the adjacency matrix it gives you the connections in the graph so for in this graph one is connected to uh, two so there is one here but one is not connected to three so there is zero here what is not connected to four so there is another zero one is connected to five so there is a one what is not connected to six there is a zero so in this way we form the whole matrix and then can there can be self loop as well so uh, based on that we get the NC matrix so this is a very simple example of graph graphs can be of several types based on uh, the, the applications it can be weighted or unweighted graph directed or undirected graph line graph heterograph or homogeneous graph multi graph so in uh, this is an example of unweighted graph because everything is one and zero but in fact uh, if you can give the, the atomic bond length information instead of one and zero like 1.2 angstrom and 2.3 angstrom and so on that becomes a weighted graph it can be a directed or undirected graph so one is connected to two that means two is connected to one so this is a kind of undirected graph but suppose you have a, a twitter follower so you are not following him or her but he is following you or she is following you so that is basically an example of directed graph so there is a directional um, component to it there can be line graph which i'm going to talk about there can be heterostructure homogeneous graph where we have multiple type of information and there can be multi graph where we have multiple connection between nodes so we described agency matrix which is a nodes by node size matrix and the degree of a node is basically how many connections each node has and basically the idea is you have the input feature um, you represent this input feature in and you put, put in a graph embedding and then we want to make a representation of the node so that it best describes the system and uh, we update the node representation and this process is basically extremely efficient on uh, gpus so the idea is uh, we take this um, input matrix x or in this case x0 or l equals to 0 is this we multiply that with the adjacency matrix which we just described here then um, we we multiply that with a learnable parameter w weights 
and to make it interesting again we put a nonlinear function so this gives us the uh, hl plus one the, the next layer representation so um yeah and the graph works locally so this is great so um it's, it's, that's why it's very uh, efficient in gpus so this is just the uh, matrix representation you can also represent using the um, uh, vectorial representation so for each i -th, uh, node uh, representation we have the uh, we have the j -th contribution for all the neighbors of i and this f is called propagation functions and based on this selection of f, f um, there can be different type of graph convolutions such as graph sage um, graph convolution and many others many many others we use align here for example so this is a one slider introduction to GCN. Um, if you want to know more about the graph neural network, uh, I will recommend uh, to go through this paper on benchmarking graph neural network. And uh, the code is also available from this uh, Yoshua Benjio's uh, article and the GitHub um, link. Okay, so a little bit unpacking it, uh, the graph convolution from material scientists. So here is an example for barium titanate, which is made of, again, the titanium, barium, and oxygen. We first define uh, end input dimensional feature vectors. So titanium can be represented by its atomic number, its atomic mass, um, its electronegativity, for example. So that's three features. Similarly, we have barium, uh, another three features, which is different from titanium and oxygen. And then we also hot encode them. And, um, and then we can have multiple features, uh, like uh, atomic uh, melting point and so on. That gives the note input feature. This is very similar to what we do something in traditional machine learning processes. So that is, uh, that part is, I hope is clear. But then uh, the idea is we have to use the um, node embedding. So once you have the node uh, input atom feature vector, we embed this on an atom embedding. Uh, uh, and then uh, we take into account the atomic distances using this kind of representation F here where uh, you can consider this actually very similar to an interatomic potential where you have elemental information and the distance based information cut off and other stuff so generally in an interatomic potential you will make a parameter you'll try to optimize for parameters but here you let the uh, neural network graph neural network decide this automatically so uh, what is a graph embedding this is a graph embedding is a way to encode high dimensional uh, uh, data into a low dimensional space. And so we do put uh, all the HI on the input uh, feature vector on a, a atom embedding. And this will be the edge embedding, which is basically the distances. And in this case for five pair, we element wise, uh, um, we, we concatenate this one and we use the RBF uh, uh, radial basis function on the distances. And then we use a something like gating function that gives the importance of each edge so it's um, so that there is some anisotropy in the graph can be captured. So again, it's very similar to the interatomic potential idea, just in a graph network representation. So with that, um, a few more words on edge gated graph convolution. So it's based on the um, this art, uh, this repository on graph deep learning, uh, and as you can see, we have the um, the source uh, node data and the destination DST the destination node data and um, and they, these are applic uh, applied in the deep graph library. So DGL is a, is a fantastic library for handling sparse matrices, for example, and they have several inbuilt functions to work on graphs. So once you have a graph uh, in the DGL format, you can apply methods such as update all and apply edges and so on, which um, to do the message passing uh, automatically, and then you can use something like uh, active, um, nonlinear activation. So in this picture, what we have the node i -th node and the corresponding j neighbors and the edge features, the distance and so on. We can kind of concatenate them, and we have a, a gating uh, weight uh, mat matrices, and then we applied a CLU kind of uh, nonlinearity, and then we sum it up to kind of get the next layer representation. So this is one of the uh, graph convolution. We can use multiple others, but uh, this is probably was most compelling when we are trying to make this formalism. So before I go to the align thing, we, I want to talk about the line graph. So a line graph can be considered as a graph of a graph. So um, 
we tried multiple methods to capture the angle information in a graph. So one of the method is you take the first nearest neighbor cutoff and you try to capture all the angles within this first near neighbor for each atom and use this as an edge feature. That's one approach. Another approach is um, you can you can take an atom and count the partial angle distribution func function around each atom and use this as a node feature. So we tried mul multiple such methods, but it didn't work out very well. So then we read about this line graph neural network idea, which is pretty interesting. So uh, what happens in line graph is suppose this is my i is an edge and j, so i is an atom, a node atom and j is another node atom and this i j is an edge. In a line graph, this edge becomes a node and this edge becomes a node. So any feature will be uh, the angles, right? So that will be a three body term. So a line graph is a graph of graph where nodes are uh, the edges and the edges are the, uh, the, the bond pairs, for example. And uh, for node feature, as I described, we have the something like electronegativity, atomic mass, atomic number, and so on that describes the node. And the edge features are based on the interatomic distance with a radial basis function. And then we have triplet features, which is the radial basis function of the angles. All right, so once we know the line graph, we can go to the align model, which is a bunch of graph and line graph models. So, uh, and it has multiple align and educated graph convolution. And uh, we have initial atom, bond, and angle features, which goes through this multiple set of um, educated graph convolution and uh, align layers with a, a graph and line graph. And then we do feature by sum across the atom, and then we predict properties. Here is a code snapshot. So here I'm showing you that um, how the align model has atom embedding with the uh, atom input features and uh, um, edge, in, edge embedding and angle embedding with RBF. And then we go through uh, multiple graph convolution and align layers. And then we do average pooling that I discussed before. And then we do a very simple uh, uh, linear model to predict properties. So example of this uh, is also available on the GitHub page. Um, so in this example, we train for uh, 50 materials, but you can expand to whatever number of materials. Well, what we give here is in a, we give a root directory where we put all the um, position file. It can be POSCAR or SIF file, but here the example, we give POSCAR files. So we put all the POSCAR file in an a Excel sheet with the ID names and their properties. It can be single output or multi output classification or regression. And then we give some certain hyperparameter configuration here. And that trains the model uh, on uh, using GPU and Google Colab. So we try to compare some of the properties uh, uh, on the materials project data set, which is I think one of the uh, most well curated data set in this community. So with the 2019 data set, we have 69,000 materials, which is also used in the Shunet and Magnet kind of papers which had formation energy and band gaps as a target. And we had the mean absolute deviation, which is the average predictive model or the baseline model. And then we have the classical forceful inspired descriptor model, which is a descriptor or hand proper descriptor model. Then we have CGCNN, uh, Magnet, Shunet, Align, and models. So we clearly see that Align is outperforming other models, uh, and especially uh, for the band gap data. So there are two interesting things here to notice. First is the mean absolute deviation versus mean absolute error is really high for uh, classical quantities such as formation energy, but not too high for the band gap. So usually you want it more than five MADs to MAE. We see that this is generally more than five, of course, but uh, for electronic band gaps, it's, um, it's uh, not in the order of 40s and so on. However, we notice that using angle information, we have decreased the um, um, MAE mean absolute error on the band gap model substantially. So this shows uh, an uh, in interesting behavior that actually including the material science knowledge, domain knowledge in the deep learning is not uh, too bad an idea. Um, usually deep learning experts would tell you that do not use any domain knowledge and uh, all the data will be learned automatically. But here we suggest here that uh, using domain knowledge is actually useful and can be um, used to make uh, reasonable predictions. So this was the performance on materials project data sets, uh, 0.02 and 0.21.
So we also tried this on the Jarvis DFT data set, which has 55,000 materials, around 14,000 materials less. So we see that the formation energy is uh, higher, MAE is higher. Again, we have, because we have around 14 k less materials. But interestingly, our band gap MAE is 0 0.14 versus 0 0.2 in the previous slide. So uh, this can be due to the different density functional method used, or it can be, there can be several reasons uh, or different uh, convergence criteria and so on. So um, what we want is basically, we want something on the order of five, uh, um, order of magnitude less than this. Then hopefully we'll uh, be reaching our deep learning uh, chemical accuracy model. That will be kind of a goal. If you can lower this five times more, that will be really interesting. And then hopefully we'll be able to make more reasonable predictions. Also, we notice here in addition to formation energy and band gap, we train multiple models such as solar cell efficiency, magnetic moment, uh, topological spin orbit spillage, etc. Around uh, 50 models like this. And, uh, and uh, it does really well for the energy based quantities and not too well for the uh, electronic quantities. So this is interesting. Um, we also applied this model on the QM9 data set, which is a molecular data set. And we kept the same number of parameters as solids. Uh, and the QM9 has around 130 K materials. So one interesting thing we notice is that a line model outperforms all the previously known graph neural network models, such as DimeNet, Plus Plus, Shanet, ArtNet, et cetera. Uh, and especially, uh, except these two targets, uh, highest occupied molecular or orbital and zero point energy, um, a line can outperform all the other properties in the, uh, in this table, at least in the uh, QM9 data set. And so that is interesting. And uh, so it says that our model can be used for both solids and molecules. It was a long, tedious process to get the hyperparameters. So we first tried a bunch of uh, parameters uh, in the align model. Then we did use the ray tune to get the final parameters. Um, some interesting thing we noticed that we had to use something like one cycler um, uh, scheduler and uh, CLU kind of activation function, which is slightly different from other graph neural network models. And we also use the DGL framework, which makes our model really, really faster compared to others. Um, okay, so layer ablation study. Any deep learning should have this component. So we want to know um, the align and GCN layer. We saw that if you use at least two GCN and two align layer, we get reasonable performance. This is uh, the Jarvis DFT formation energy ablation study. And similarly, we use around 200 hidden features, then we get a reasonable um, models. And we did several evolution study for other components of the align model as well, which is available in our paper, but uh, you, can, you can look into it if you're interested. Another com important component is a training time study. So one way to compare timing for model training is the epoch per minute or time per epoch. So uh, we have Align, Magnet, Shunet, DimeNet, DimeNet++, CGCNN, and models. So we uh, tried the QM9 U0 model. And then we see that the time per epoch uh, for Align is comparable to other models. Uh, however, I would like to point out that although the time per epoch could be 6.8 versus 3.4 or 3.0, the total number of epochs to reach the desired accuracy can be different. So in this case, a line will reach the accuracy in 300 epoch, but uh, other models might take 3000 epoch. So in, in the longer run, a line can be faster. So this is something in, interesting to note. Uh, I will not go into details of the application align here, but because of the time, but I'd like to point out a few brief applications. So uh, one interesting topic is AI for climate change. So um, one of the particular application is carbon capture, carbon dioxide capture using metal organic framework. So metal organic framework can be considered as a metal ion organic linker uh, material. And we have several database of metal organic framework. And metal organic framework basically captures CO2 in these pockets. And there are uh, our pores and there are materials such as zeolites, uh, which are traditionally used for carbon capture, but metal organic frameworks are extremely promising because of the high functionalities. And there have been databases such as HMOF, a hypothetical MOF, 
Metal Organic Framework Database, which has around 137,000 MOF materials. And they also provide nicely the Grand Canonical Monte Carlo simulation for CO2 adsorption. And in fact, this uh, GCMC for CO2 adsorption compare well with experiments. So uh, using the 80-10-10 training validation and test split, again, we, uh, predict, we try to predict the uh, multi-output model for CO2 adsorption at different pressure. So these are the five best and five worst predictions. So again, these are the five bottom ones. So you can even, the uh, best one are definitely good, really good. And the worst one also, they have good trend. And uh, they are either, they are not systematic, but they are, some of them are high, some of them are low with respect to the Grand Canonical Monte Carlo. So after we train this model in HMOF, we actually tried this model on other MOF data sets, such as core MOF, and we then screened the uh, best uh, few uh, MOF from uh, material that can be synthesized that our experimental collaborator can grow in, in lab and test this uh, deep learning guided uh, screening and so on. So in addition to this, we can screen uh, materials such as solar cells, um, piezoelectric dielectric materials, topological materials, thermoelectric materials, and so on. We have done this work with CFID model, but we can definitely do this with align model. So this was a uh, atomistic line graph. Let's go to the atom vision model which is a deep learning framework for atomistic image data, which is available at usnet.gov slash atomvision. Um, so there we, there we have two types of data, scanning tunnel microscopy images and scanning transmission electron microscopy images, especially for the 2D materials. So we use the uh, scan STM Turs of Hammond approach with constant height and constant current images. So the Turs of Hammond approach is based on the idea that tunneling currents uh, is proportional to the IL DOS or integrated local density of states, which can be computed using the density functional theory. And here is an example for 2D materials. And these are especially suitable for 2D materials because they don't have much dangling bounds. Um, and uh, in the first and third column, we have the simulated images. And the third, second, and the fourth column are the experimental images. And you can see they compare really well uh, for the HTM images. And this was published in the Nature Scientific Data Paper uh, Journal. And uh, similarly with STEM, we use the convolution approximation, appro approximation, which is a basic approximation and can be used for thin films such as 2D materials. The convolution approximation is based on the Rutherford model of scattering. So where Z, the intensity uh, of scattering is, uh, is, is, is uh, proportional to the, to the Z square, but here we use, because there are a lot of other losses, we used 1.7 or 1.4. So using this uh, model of convolution approximation, we can simulate STEM images of the 2D materials. Uh, for general materials, we use multi-slice, but for this multi-slice simulation, which can capture phonons uh, and other contribution, but for 2D material, this should uh, work well. And we actually see that in the uh, examples for com comparison to experiments such as uh, graphene, ion telluride and molida sulfide, uh, the STM and STEM, this is the experimental and first and uh, third column are experiments and the second and fourth columns are similar images. Uh, they compare quite well. So one of the tasks we want to solve using this image data set is the uh, 2D classification. So this is very similar to uh, ImageNet or other image uh, classification models such as uh, classifying cat and dog and such. Uh, and some other uh, classes. So here we want to classify the whether a 2D material is what kind of uh, Bravi lattice uh, it lie on. So there are five uh, possible Bravi lattice in 2D materials, hexagonal, square, rectangle, rhombus, parallelogram, etc. cetera. Um, usually uh, in during experiments, we'll use a Fourier transform of that image. And then we can, based on that, we'll tell whether what kind of lattice it is, uh, but it can be cumbersome when we have thousands and thousands of uh, images and rather we will give it to the machine vision or torch uh, vision kind of packages so that it can automatically identify the lattice. So that's the goal here. So once we have the STM and STEM image data set for thousands of 2D material that we developed, we use this uh, pre-trained model such as VGG, Google Net, uh, ResNet, and ShebNet and DenseNet models, which is available in the torch vision package and, and trained on multiple and thousands of image data. 
and uh, we apply this on the 2D STM and 2D STEM image data set, and we get more than 80% accuracy. So we notice that the baseline model for uh, this uh, performance is would be 20%, so one over five, 20%. So our model is doing about four times better than the random guessing model, which is actually very promising. So this is the image classification task. Um, if you want to train using a Google notebook, this is an example given here in the Atom Vision repository where you say what kind of uh, model you want to use, for example, DenseNet. You give the training folder where you have all the images with the class, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, for five classes and the test folder, and it will do the training for you. Even so, even if you don't know much Python programming and so on, you can use it. Um, okay, so Atom Vision example. Uh, in addition to classification, we can use something like uh, feature extraction and semantic uh, uh, um, image segmentation uh, uh, applications. So here is an example for uh, MO vacancy and MOS2 and iron vacancy and iron tail drive. So what we can do is uh, we can detect using something like half circles where the atoms are or some other models or and then we can construct a atomistic line graph, similarly what we described in the earlier model. And then uh, we can predict properties directly. So that will be something very useful for the experimentalist, I believe, because we'll be our, uh, our huge DFE data set will no longer be a standalone in its own world. So we directly link to the experiment. So that will be very useful. Uh, this is still an ongoing work and we are very excited about it. So this was Atom Vision. Let's talk about Atom QC or Atomistic Calculation on Quantum Computers Package, which is again available at US NISCAP slash Atom QC. And here's uh, Google CEO uh, who, with right next to the quantum computer machine, well, a model of it. So Google's recently claimed quantum supremacy and this is another very uh, exciting technology that has come along. And uh, this technology has been mainly applied to molecules, small molecules uh, with a couple cluster kind of methods. And we wanted to see whether we can use this methodology or this quantum computation method for solids or how to use this for solids, um, where we have periodic boundary condition. So I'll give a very brief uh, introduction to the quantum computation here. So in a quantum computation, well, current state of quantum computation, uh, we have two major one of the major algorithms is variation quantum eigensolver. So in any chemistry problem, um, we are trying to find the energy level of a Hamiltonian, right? So um, what VQ does is, is actually a hybrid classical quantum algorithm. And you take a Hamiltonian and choose a particular ANSAS and circuit with the trainable, trainable parameters like theta zero, and we feed it to the quantum computer. So we notice that quantum computers are good for preparing quantum states. So once we give this, and then we get the expectation value, and then um, it feeds that to a classical optimizers because quantum computers are not very good, and at least currently they are not very good at classical optimizing the parameters. So in this hybrid for, uh, loop, we we keep uh, ongoing this loop until we reach desired accuracy. You can find more details of our VQE algorithm in this Nature Communication article. Um, and so this again gives you the ground state eigenvalue and eigenfunction. How about other eigenvalue and uh, other eigenfunction of the qubit Hamiltonian matrix? So for that, we can use something called variation uh, quantum deflation algorithm, which is actually a very simple idea that once we know the ground state eigenvalue and eigenfunction, we can deflate the whole matrix and get the high level uh, energies. So I want to make it clear that these are not the excited state, uh, like we talk about uh, many body perturbation theory and other excited states. They are just the, within the same theory, but non-ground state eigenlevels. So I want to make that clear. So um, if you use something like classical computer for a small system, this is very, very fast. Uh, but for uh, quantum, it's just a proof of concept and uh, we'll be testing for a few solid materials in this particular work. Here's a typical flow chart of how to use uh, quantum computers on atomic structure. So we use one year tight binding Hamiltonian. So once you have atomic structure, uh, we can use DFT plus one year 90 or finite difference and density functional perturbation theory for electrons and phonons respectively to get one year tight binding Hamiltonian representation. 
So a one-year function is a complete orthonormalized basis set, and it's actually a very good bridge between the delocalized plane wave and the localized atomic orbital representation, and most of the DFT codes actually support one-year fu function generation. So uh, once we have the one-year function, and we have the tool in the Jarvis tools anyways, so you can look into it. So once we have that one, we can convert that uh, one-year tight binding Hamiltonian to a two by N by two by N matrix. So we could use here the same like uh, plane wave basis, uh, which will give us, give us something like 20,000 by 20,000 matrix, which is huge for current quantum computers. So that's why having a one-year tight binding ML, uh, representation is very helpful. All right, so once we have this uh, N qubit uh, uh, matrix, we transform it into a poly basis and then we feed it to quantum circuit, which I'm gonna talk about. As we said, we'll use the variation quantum uh, eigensolver and the variation quantum deflection to get the, uh, the, all the eigenvalues. And then we feed to something like green function uh, with a zero self energy and then feed it to impurity solver to get the actual uh, green function that can break the something like band gap very accurately. So this is a typical flow chart and this is published in the general phase condensed matter this year. So one of the key differences of using the classical versus quantum computers. So we can go to our classical computer like laptop or something and then maybe make our arithmetic operations, some, some multiplication, etc. We don't need to think about the circuits which, is, which it is using. However, for quantum computers, we do have to consider this. For each problem, there's a specific circuit that we have to use or answers we have to use. So these are some of the six circuits that we, used, we tried so circuit one, circuit two, circuit three is for three qubits and it's based of RY gates and RZ gates. And as D, E, F are known as uh, real amplitude poly two design and efficient SC2 circuit. And they have, in addition to RY rotational gates, they have the controlled X not, uh, control X and Z gates. And we'll see how does these circuits perform for predicting the eigenvalues. So we take a very simple example of aluminum, right? So uh, we want to predict the aluminum gamma point energy level for electronic one-year tight binding Hamiltonian. And we see that all the six circuits actually do pretty well for predicting the uh, eigenvalue. But when we go to the X point, which is non-gamma point obviously, only four and six circuit, which is the re real amplitude and efficient FC2. They are the only circuit which can uh, get the um, eigenvalue correctly. And if you, if you go further, like a multi-component system and so on, we see that not just one repeat unit, not just one repeat on unit of six circuit, you have to use multiple repeat unit until like four repeat unit to get the um, eigenvalue correctly. Here's an example. So uh, for a given material such as aluminum, you can get the one-year tight binding Hamiltonian from Jarvis and then get an HK for a particular K point. And then we have made this Hermitian solver class using Cascade that will solve the uh, Hermitian matrix and using VQE and for a particular circuit. So here we are taking circuit six and you can take something like state vector simulator or CASM simulator or other quantum computers. And that will give you the classical VQE, classical and VQE eigenvalue that you can compare. All right, so in addition to Cascade, we can use something like Tequila, uh, Open Fermion, um, there are a few more, uh, Penny Lane, et cetera, in addition with a similar idea. Here's a again, complete example of aluminum. So in this left-hand side, uh, we have, as we mentioned, the VQE is a classical quantum hybrid algorithm. So they are different kind of classical optimizer. So we compare this for aluminum band structure, aluminum uh, X point, um, one-year tight banding electronic Hamiltonian. And we found this Kobila and uh, SLSQP probably are the better ones for classical optimizer. Once we select that, we actually use variation quantum deflation for predicting the whole entire one year tight binding Hamiltonian based uh, electronic band structure using VQD and the exact NumPy solvers. So they agree very well. Uh, and we had to use at least five repeat units uh, consistently of this, uh, the circuit six model. And we can get similarly uh, much. Uh, uh, in a good uh, agreement for the phonon band structures. So that was the example of elemental system, but we applied this for thousands of other um, 2D uh, multi-component systems. So we, to limit the computation in the quantum computers, we limit ourselves to an n qubits five, five qubit system. And then for that, we get the 
uh, phonon and the electronic um, one-year tire bending Hamiltonian for 930 and 300 materials respectively. And we here we are trying to predict the gamma point uh, energy levels. And you can see they agree quite well with the NumPy solver and the VQE solver. So this is very interesting. Uh, also, we noticed that we had to use the efficient ST2 circuit throughout the all entire material set. We are trying to extend it to the dynamical mean field theory. I think this is probably one of the most interesting application of the quantum computers. So dynamical mean field theory is a commonly used technique for solving predicting electronic structure of coelectric systems. And it is uh, a many, it maps a many body lattice to a many body local problems. In DMFT, we have HK that we can get from the VQD, a Wilson constant deflation, feed it into this uh, equation with sigma zero, right? And then we can calculate the, uh, the spectral function and the, the hybridization function that can go into something like a quantum impurity solver. And do it, we can do it multiple times to uh, get the sigma. Uh, the self energy that if we add to the green function, we can get the uh, accurate band structure, etc. So this is still an ongoing work. So in conclusion, I would like to point out that uh, NIST Jarvis database has thousands of materials, properties, etc. Uh, it's an open access uh, platform, so please feel free to contribute. There's a lot of opportunity in this field. I would also like to uh, point out that some of the future works we are interested, such as um, using atomistic line graph with classical force field or tight bending would be very interesting as a hybrid method. Um, having the implementation for the quantum computers with impurity solver will be very interesting. Using the images as a graph, new network will be very interesting. So there are several new ideas which are coming along and hopefully next time you hear me, we'll have some updates about that. Um, and these are again, some of the links. And if you have any question, please feel free to reach out. I'm pretty quick with emails, so uh, I hope I'll reply you uh, early and you can find more details on the computational material science, NPG computational material science article here. And with that, I'd like to thank again to all of you for attending this talk and uh, our organizers from the materials project. I think this has been really great uh, for me. So yeah, thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. If you yeah, thanks, Kamar, for the great talk. Uh, now we are entering the Q&A session. Selects it. There's no change. It selects five extra key points, uh, extra point to check whether it's actually converged or not. And then if it is, then it decides, OK, this is a converged quantity. And I want to point out that we are converging only on energy. If you do a sophisticated calculation for a, one particular material, like old fashioned style, when people used to do PhD on one particular material, you will converge on different, like uh, its energy, its forces, its other properties. But here we are only converging on the energies. Okay, and then can you elaborate on the conversion and how does it influence computer property? So I personally found that, uh, especially for properties such as phonons, elastic constants, uh, dielectric tensor, magnetic moment, these are extremely critical. Um, and again, I'm saying that I, although we, we converge on the energies, our convergence seems to do much better job uh, on creating those uh, non-energy quantities as well. So that's what interesting. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, next question is from Philippe Torres. He's asking, what is the role of node self-interaction in graph neural network, right? Uh, so maybe I missed, uh, if I understand your question, question correctly, um, we have the identity matrix, right, that we described. And then uh, it, with, with the A, we have identity matrix. So with this identity matrix actually consider the interaction of the node with itself. So A plus I is A tilde. I think I didn't describe that one. So uh, that is the uh, that is very important. Else you'll the else you'll miss the interaction of the node in, uh, feature itself. So that is uh, important. Uh, hopefully that should answer the question. Uh, okay. So what was the next one? Has anybody used deep learning or machine learning method in connection with supercapacitors? Supercapacitors. I am not familiar with it. Um, this field is rapidly expanding, so I can keep track of it, but hopefully uh, if you are expert, please look into it and, um, okay, so I don't, I don't know in other top of my head any work like this. Uh, is the comparison made with experimental data or MP only? Okay, so, um, so there are two parts, right? So first is for usual uh, making the database part, we compare 
uh, the small uh, chunk or small subset with experiments wherever apl applicable to get the error bar on our um, uh, prediction of the entire data set. But of course, this is not possible for the, all the materials, you know. Um, and the, if, if you're thinking about the error on the uh, machine learning part, so we what we do is we take the entire um, uh, data and we split into 80, 10, 10, training validation and test split. And uh, we train on, for example, 80% and then validate and, and use it on the validation and test set. So in this way, we are not directly comparing to the experimental data. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, so another question is from Kerry Wrighton Aranida. Uh, so fascinating. Um, the application, thank you. Uh, the application of these new techniques to resolve materials research is awesome. Uh, I agree with you completely. <laughs> is it possible to use graph convolution to propo uh, propose new crystalline structure based on molecules as starting point? I mean, if Jarvis can develop a conformational search to find set of minimum energy conformation, then to use this as a set to propose possible crystal structure and the electronic part, I'm glad to see this presentation. Thank you. So there are two components to this question I see. First, you can do a starting search kind of a new crystalline material. So there have been uh, uh, methods such as genetic algorithm and USPEX and all these methods where you can take parent structure and kind of make these structures and let kind of this deep learning or machine learning model guide the process. So that is one way of genetic new structures and new formation. Another way is which I'm actually very interested and in, actually I'm working today on this. <laughs> is the uh, uh, generative adversarial network, GAN, and various autoencoder. These are really fascinating techniques. It has certain limitations to it, but using this technique also, given a, a particular property and given a kind of starting uh, confirmation, you can find uh, what should be the next uh, uh, possible material. So these techniques have been applied for molecules and for, for solids, it's actually very difficult. Uh, there have been like voxel kind of techniques and some other techniques. But uh, using the graph, it's actually quite difficult, but uh, we are trying to work on it. So great idea, we are working on it. I Isaiah Moses is asking some question. If bond, dis where is it? Okay. if bond distances and bond angles have to be calculated to get the features, it means I need to know my structure completely. Yes, that is true. What is the advantage of machine learning then? Since electronic properties like band gap and formation energy with DFT might not be more expensive than the calculation that had to be done to obtain the features. Wait, so let me just take back from there. So even if you know atomic structure, you know, like ICSD, you cannot tell what what be the band gap of that material, right? So you have to do it like DFT calculation, which takes a long time, uh, etc. So this is where we are saying that if uh, if you have experimental structure and you used to use something like density functional theory, something to predict property, instead of that, we can use uh, machine learning to predict properties. Uh, with certain limitations, of course. So that is the whole idea. So in this way, um, yeah, uh, I have to disagree with you a little bit, but uh, the, again, the idea is uh, to predict uh, the properties directly from crystal structure. I also want to point out there have been few works where we actually don't have to know the whole crystal structures completely, and then also you can predict uh, properties. Uh, I have seen some papers like this as well. So if you're interested, feel free to reach me out. I can send you the papers. Okay, next, anonymous. For the crystal graphs, how do you define starting edges? Nearest neighbor, how do you deal with the periodicity? Do you build graph over supercell or unit cell? Okay, I apologize, I, I forgot to mention the details about this. So uh, as you rightly mentioned, we take k nearest neighbors, we take 12 nearest neighbor around each atom, right? And uh, if the if, if, if the unit cell only have like two atoms, it of course doesn't have 12 nearest neighbor. So we will build the uh, supercell in the image form, image way. So, it will know what image to get the atoms from. We actually do not build the supercell. There is a hypothetical image kind of thing uh, you can make and get the atomic coordinates of the neighbors. And this is how we do it. You can find it in the um, uh, in the repo repository. If you go to the readme page, I think I describe it there. Um, yeah, these are all bond uh, distances and k nearest neighbor. Okay, is I asked another question? Maybe improving on composition based features might be better for electronic properties at least. Yeah, I agree with you. So, you know, this is something I, I really want to look into it, but just don't have the bandwidth right now. So I want to do a combinatorial search so that we can have certain features and atomic numbers and other hot encoding versus not hot encoding and so on. Uh, and then hopefully this will, uh, so electronic properties are really bothering me. I mean, this is something really bothering me. We can't get the band gap model so well. 
So this is something to look into, look into as well. So one thing I also didn't point out, in addition to the node feature, we can think about the dihedral angle, which we actually do not consider explicitly. So uh, maybe uh, in a different model, in, in addition to the bond distance, bond angle, and uh, we also include dihedral and other end body because the line graph can be extended very easily. Um, so hopefully using that, uh, we'll be able to solve this electronic property problem, but again, it becomes very complex and expensive. So we have to think carefully how to do that one. Okay, anonymous attendee, except for one year, are there other bases like natural orbitals available in Jarvis? Great suggestion. Yeah, I really want to uh, add other uh, orbitals also, uh, but currently we have only one year orbitals. Um, great suggestion though. Uh, I'll keep in mind. Okay, Bala Ramachandran, can you talk? Uh, can you talk a bit more about strategies you are using to correct DFT band gaps? Ah, so, right. So we are right now using uh, the meta GZ Tran Blaha modified Becky Johnson potential, which is actually uh, very good, especially for non correlated systems. And we are doing that. Uh, and we also have a database for hybrid functionals for like, I think, 200 materials. And Tran Blaha modified Becky Johnson for, I think, 17,000 materials. Uh, so this is one of the strategy. Um, we have actually uh, um, tried other functions like scan and stuff, but uh, we are actually quite happy with the TV and the way it works. So yeah, that is the strategy we are attending. Uh, Anurak Udome, uh, he's asking in comparison, how fast of two methods between C, GCMC and your DL model? And please explain a bit why. Okay. So GCMC is faster, you know, based on force field, but I would say deep learning uh, model is like maybe 100 times or more faster. So what happens in GCMC, you have to know the force field first, which is again, it's a, it's a whole new game. I'm not going to there, but you have to have the particular force field for your grand canonical Monte Carlo. You have to develop that. Once you develop that, you have to run the GCMC calcul uh, calculation, which takes around maybe 20 minutes per mock or something like this. Uh, uh, but if you use graph convolution, you have atomic structure and within maybe five seconds, it will predict the uh, property. So definitely much, much faster. Okay, Robert. Oh, hi, Robert. Uh, come on, very interesting work. What is your favorite DFT quote for this work? Uh, were you able to indicate? <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is some uh, interaction I had with Robert. So uh, uh, right now I'm in tie to VASP. Mainly uh, we also have a quantum espresso database coming along. Uh, Kevin Garrity is doing that in our group. So we don't have uh, integrated the NWCAM yet, but uh, yeah, we, we might think into it. Okay. So please. Karakos Basak, he is this um, method only valid for 2D materials? So wait, this uh, you mean the image, I guess you're asking. So the STM and STEM image generation is uh, the kind of method we use. We can use, we are using only for 2D material because it's, it doesn't have dangling bonds, but you can use for like aluminum oxide or other surfaces. But again, uh, it won't be very accurate. You have to use something like multi-slice simulation and stuff. And also you will have to use something like different tip in STM. Right now we use S-Wave. Um, you can use something like Bardin method and stuff, et cetera, for S STM. So works really well for 2D material. That's why you are using it. But the method is in itself is not limited. OK, there's one more question. Bhupesh uh, Bishnoi, very interesting talk. Thank you. If I'm correct, the property of material come from the orbital SPDF interaction. You are right. So by looking at bond length, angle, or even Lattice packing density will give type of material like metal, semiconductor, etc. So I'm thinking, can we use in graph neural uh, network orbital information for creating atomic property? Do you have any comment? So yeah, there have been few works about this. I think I saw this paper on Orbnet, which I think used the orbital in, uh, information. And uh, one of uh, one of the member of the Jarvis, the Kevin Garrity, he's also interested in this kind of uh, uh, orbital interaction. So. Um, yeah, so this is something we'll look into it in future. Okay, so the Claudia Copix, if edges are only created with nearest neighbor, doesn't it impair the performance, e.g. aromatic uh, system where the electronic structure is bigger than just a few atoms? Ah, so, okay, so I, I, I don't have background to say what does it do with the aromatic systems, but um, we try to capture the distance as well as the angles, right, the directionality. So um, using that information, we I hope we are capturing all the necessary chemistry, like um, how we distinguish different uh, molecules. So yeah, I don't have a great answer for this one, unfortunately. 
Um, yeah. So great Q and A sessions. We still have about seventy participants who are still staying with us till the end. That's really impressive. So, yeah. Again, thank you so much, Kamal, for the wonderful talk and also the great Q and A session. And for those of you who still have other questions, feel free to ask on the uh, material science dot org and the materials project uh, channel. And maybe uh, Kamal can hop on and uh, answer some questions uh, about the talk. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye.